Hello and welcome. I'm Claudine Wong from KTVU Channel 2 News. Welcome to a roundtable of candidates running for the City of Pleasant Hills City Council. Today's forum is sponsored by the Contra Costa County Elections Division, Contra Costa Television, and the West County and Diablo Valley Leagues of Women Voters. We're recording these roundtables here in studios of the Contra Costa Television with assistance from the cities of Concord, Richmond, and Walnut Creek. These six candidates running for two positions are Andre Obolinski, Jonna Thompson, Sue Nowak, and Zach Shess. Bill Bankert and Daniel Rodriguez could not join us today. So we drew lots before the show to determine the speaking order. We're gonna give each candidate about 30 seconds to just introduce themselves and give us a look at their priorities. And we're gonna start with Andre Obolinski. Hi, hello neighbors. My name is Andre Obolinski. I'm running for city council here in Pleasant Hill. And uh, I have a basic platform of fairness and equality for all. Uh, we, my, my three major uh, key points are gonna be uh, smart housing uh, to address our workforce needs, making sure that we balance the budget in the city. I mean, I have an MBA uh, from St. Mary's College and I do work in business on a regular basis. And also planning for the future uh, and, and making sure that future has small business uh, growth within that. Thank you. All right, Jonna Thompson. I'm raising my family in Pleasant Hill, and my husband's grandfather moved here in 1969, and my mother-in-law and my husband have attended Sequoia Elementary, uh, College Park, and um, DVC, and we are keeping the tradition with my daughter attending Sequoia Elementary this year. I offer new eyes to the same issues and bring a fresh perspective, and I know that together we can bring Pleasant Hill to be a leader in environmental policy, green infrastructure, growing communities through smart growth development, and ensuring that Pleasant Hill offers top quality of life for our families. And Sue Nowak. Hi, I'm Sue Nowak. I'm running for re-election for the city council. I have been on the city council for the last eight years uh, and am thrilled to be running again. Uh, my priorities are obviously addressing the housing challenges, that's balancing our small town feel with the requirements of the state uh, being put on us to increase our housing significantly. Also traffic congestion, uh, which we face a lot of in Pleasant Hill, um, and also safety that has arisen over the last couple of years. And in addition, dealing with the environment while we're addressing housing, traffic, and the rest. So I look forward to the interaction with my fellow candidates this morning. Thank you. All right, and Zach Chess. Thank you, Claudine. Hi, I'm Zach Shass. Uh, I've been on the uh, Pleasant Hill Recreation and Park District Board for about the last 10 years. My motivation for running for City Council in Pleasant Hill is pretty simple. I love this town, and I, I wanna see it grow and thrive in the years ahead. Uh, my priorities are, you know, I believe that uh, democracy is a participation sport, and I wanna make sure that our citizens have the best communications from their city. It's also, the city is a service, and I want to make sure that our services are provided as efficiently and effectively as possible. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so let's do this right now. Let's start diving into some of the major issues that you guys have all raised. I want to start with housing because obviously that is, you know, a, a key issue for for many cities, and the Pleasant Hill is is no exception to that. Uh, John, let's start with you in terms of where you see housing in the situation as it stands now, and and kind of what's next. What what do you what would you like to see change? Right now, the city is working really hard to meet our arena requirements. We have numbers that we have to account for when we go to the state. If we don't account for those numbers, then we are in violation of what the California state wants us to do, and we can lose funding, as well as um, we can lose funding as well as um, our ability to offer permits, and that will take, be taken over by the state for us. So it is a very serious issue. We need to make sure that while we are building to meet the requirements, we are also looking at our community and ensuring that what we are putting in place meets the needs of the community, expanding our parks, expanding our infrastructure, and expanding our uh, traffic guidelines to decrease traffic in Pleasant Hill as we build all this additional housing. Sue, your thoughts on housing? Yeah, so I sit on the General Plan Advisory Committee, which is also working on the housing element, trying to address the 1,803 units that we have to zone for in Pleasant Hill. And that's a significant challenge, as the last uh, arena cycle only required about 400 uh, units. So it's a significant increase, and a significant impact to Pleasant Hill. 
However, it's important that we have our housing elements certified. Uh, as Zana Post uh, mentioned earlier, we raised $14 million or received $14 million in grants. Um, and they, we only receive those if we have a certified housing element. So in order to maintain the local control, we need to address these. Now, a couple of things that we're addressing because we wanna make sure we are having housing for all types, all income, age. Um, we've, we've done a number of things in the last couple of years. We've approved an 82 unit low income senior housing in Pleasant Hill. We've approved two projects for workforce housing, uh, reducing property taxes and having tax-free uh, bonds finance it are allowing those rents to be decreased and then capped as far as they can increase. That will allow more teachers, firefighters, police officers to be able to uh, live in Pleasant Hill. We've also given two properties from our successor agency to Habitat for Humanity, which are bu building 11 units. And so we are constantly looking at creative ways that we can address the housing shortage, um, but also maintain that small town feel. All right, Zach. Yeah, thank you. As as Sue pointed out, you know, the housing is is a, is a challenge. It's we need to, to find you know 1,800 units uh, in our in our city in a, in a pretty short period of time, uh, and we need to balance that uh, you know with the with the needs of the community. And so I, I, in my previous experience on the Recreation Park District, you know, I've dealt with land use issues, and it's it's balancing those is always is always a, a difficult thing to do but it's really critical moving forward with our housing element uh, I you know this sits clo close to home to me in the sense that you know I have a son who basically looked around and he's an adult I you know, graduated from college basically looked around and was like I don't know where <laughs> I don't know where I can buy a place or even think about that and he moved out of state and so to, to Sue's earlier point, we need to create housing uh, for everyone, and and that's and that's the thing about the the arena is it 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 looks at that. It's not just you know single family R10 big lots. It's it's you know uh, it's housing for for everyone, and I think that's critical. Okay, Andre. Yeah, everybody brought up great points about housing. Um, as a small business owner in the community, uh, I have a challenge uh, every day when I go into work work with my employees. Um, throughout the past couple of weeks, I've been out talking with business owners in the community. And the challenge that I keep on hearing is my staff can't afford to live here. And that's not just a Pleasant Hill problem, it's also a regional problem. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons why I'm here sitting at this table because I look at my staff and what they have to endure and go through. Um, also my customers, uh, when, when you have to pay more for your staff, you, your customers have to pay more. Ultimately, we all are paying for the lack of housing. Whenever we go into a small business, whenever we purchase something, uh, whenever we order something, uh, so it's it's almost at a crisis level. But there are smart ways we can address this. I mean, we already have some junior, junior ADU ADU programs in place. Um, there's some legislation that came down from the state about being able to make duplexes on properties. But the most important thing for me is being that my business is in Walnut Creek. I don't want us to lose our small town feel like Walnut Creek did. I want to make sure that we keep um, the community the way it is while adding housing. Okay, balance seems to be a, a good theme here in terms of, of growth. When you have growth, you have transportation issues. You have people getting out and about. We've certainly seen that as the pandemic has, has advanced and people are going back to work. How do we balance transportation? What do you think the biggest challenges are? You know, obviously Pleasant Hill is surrounded by a lot of other communities, so you, it's, it's not a bubble. So we'll start with you on, on what you think in terms of, of transportation, in and out, and, and how to handle some of the challenges. So we do have trans, uh, transportation traffic issues in Pleasant Hill, and, and they stem primarily from two areas. Uh, one is um, being at the crossroads of 680 and uh, 24 and 4, sort of we're boundered our boundaries are sort of outlined a bit by them, we end up being a pass-through when any of the highways get congested. And so then they come through Taylor Boulevard, Contra Costa Boulevard, and that causes a lot of traffic. So obviously making sure that the highways working around us are working as well as they can to reduce that impact is helpful. The second thing is from schools. Uh, we have very good schools in Pleasant Hill, and we have a lot of traffic coming into Pleasant Hill as a result of the schools. Our public schools, DVC, which has got, uh, I think, 24,000 students, creates a lot of traffic and a lot of issues. So um, I sit on 
Uh, the County Connection Board, is, which is a central Contra Costa bus trans transit um, entity. Uh, I sit on TransPAC, which is our regional transportation um, authority, and also CCTA, which is the county transportation. So there are a number of things being worked on. Working on, as I mentioned, the highways, making them more efficient, making the bus system better so that more people will use it and have it be more effective and timely. Um, and then working with the school district, I've spent some time working with the superintendent trying to address this, because this is an issue with all the um, cities uh, within Mount Diablo Unified. So we've been working with them as well. Not a lot of solutions at this point, but we're working on them. Within the city, we're looking at, this week I believe, we start up with our electronic scooter system, uh, BIRD. And that will be great because we can see people using electric scooters on some of the trails and some of the roads to get from downtown to the new library or to DVC. So I think that's gonna be an exciting opportunity and get some people off the roads. So there's a lot of opportunities, uh, but there are also a lot of challenges. And, and those are some of the areas I'd, I'd focus on. Zach, your thoughts on transportation traffic? Well, I, I think it almost, it almost goes back to in a way, housing, in, in the sense that you have, we have an opportunity perhaps to look at building, you know, closer to transportation hubs. Uh, and and the, 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 the general plan and the housing element is, is looking at that as, as, as addressing that already in the sense of, you know, build, looking at what we can do along the Contra Costa Boulevard corridor. What can we build possibly out towards DVC? That, that kind of plays a role in it as, as well. That's just, that's just part of it too. I, and I think there's some other you know, traffic issues too that I'd like to see particularly, I, you know, I know that there hasn't been a lot of traction uh, with the school district, but I think if we could look at maybe staggering start times, you know, we have two schools on Boyd that are literally next door to each other. What can we do possibly to do that? To try to, to stagger the start time so not everybody is there at the same time. Also, more specifically, I'd like to look at Morello Boulevard. Uh, I've been told by residents that live in that area, it's kind of a it's kind of a racetrack. You know, what can we do there? Can we perhaps make that a you know a wider you know wider for bike lanes, uh, and and then allow that maybe to, to be a calmer uh, arterial in that area. So those are just a couple things. All right, Andre, your thoughts? Yeah, a lot of great points. Um, as we start looking to the future, it's not just what's happening next week, it's what's happening four years from now, eight years from now. Um, we're talking about uh, electric cars replacing the internal combustion engine, automated driving. We have all these technologies coming down the pipe. Uh, the challenge that we have with our city, like a lot of other cities, is it's designed in a 1950s mentality of when the car was the primary mode of transportation. And as the Bay Area urbanizes, um, it's about looking at solutions like Zach talked about with housing and Sue as well, um, and making sure that we can have buses, we can have transit points where people can get to those jobs, but also building good jobs within the city um, and along with housing at the same time so people really don't have to commute. No commute. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <gasps> right, Donna? I think there were many good points brought up and uh, working with our county partners to increase uh, accessibility to the freeways and highways and the main roads would be a great opportunity to start. Um, but I would also encourage focusing on walkability. A lot of families in Pleasant Hill have mentioned that there is a lack of sidewalks. There is um, no safe bike lanes that are accessible to uh, bicyclists and families with young children who want to use bikes um, to be able to access key locations in our neighborhoods. And that does increase the traffic that goes through the city. And if we're able to increase our walkability score, which we could do with the housing element, then we are able to provide opportunities for our citizens to be able to not need a car. I think right now our focus should be how can we reduce the need for vehicles and then we can be able to resolve the transportation issue. I feel like that dovetails us into uh, talking about the environment. You guys have mentioned the environment being important and, and going green in Pleasant Hill. Uh, Zach, I want to start with you in terms of where you think that uh, in the priority list of and, and, and you know what can be accomplished on that front in Pleasant Hill. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously something in the environment, that's a, that's a regional, that's a global uh, yep. endeavor, right? So what, what can a city government do, you know, in Pleasant Hill? And I think, you know, we can certainly look at, you know, the, the, the more granular things about, you know, packaging and, and encouraging our, you know, encouraging our businesses to, to be green in their practices. 
without throwing an undue burden upon them and, and increasing their costs. <laughs> uh, as we know, cost and inflation and things like that already are, are, are pretty high, but I, I think there's some opportunities there. I think as far as the city goes, I mean, I think there's an opportunity for more uh, you know, green uh, vehicles, uh, and, you know, both in Pleasant Hill and, uh, and in the region. One other thing I thought about too recently, just and someone brought up to me was like, why aren't there solar panels on, on City Hall? Maybe Sue could address that. <laughs> but uh, you know, those kinds of things. You know, what are, what are we doing as a city to possibly to to, to you know help with the you know the energy creation that's not relying on fossil fuels, All right? Or natural gas. <laughs> Andre, your thoughts? Which is both. Yeah, so when we look at environmentalism, everybody thinks like, oh, the environment, this is something that's gonna cost money. Actually, you can save a lot of money by, by, by helping the environment. Uh, part of it is education at the, even at a household level of LED lights, uh, insulation, windows, uh, as we're remodeling with projects, making sure that people understand Title 24. Um, and, and even at a business level, I, I would love to put solar panels on my roof, but my landlord, you know, it's kind of uh, hard to uh, get him to do that. Um, but really what it boils down to is we start looking forward. Uh, I talked previously about our 1950s, you know, uh, structure is how we build out that infrastructure. You know, how we look at um, the way that our city and our region is going to be shaped to um, build in a smart way so that we don't need to use uh, even electric vehicles down the road because electric vehicles still are going to uh, pollute the environment with tires, uh, brake pads, different things that have to be changed. So, um, Gianna talked about walkability. Yeah, that's it's she's actually correct on that. As as we need to make it a walkable walkable community, um, where people don't have to get into a car and drive places, uh, moving forward. So that's um, that's how we uh, address the environmental side of it, from uh, the household level all the way up to a community level. Gianna. It's very easy to get lost in the weeds with this question. We can start, you know, talking about adding electric vehicle charging stations. Right now we have some at the library and at City Hall. We obviously need more. Um, we can talk about putting, you know, uh, solar panels on all the homes. But what I want to focus on is, again, that walkability score and also new builds. If we are going to be building in Pleasant Hill as required and uh, focusing on what our community needs, we need to open the conversation on what our community wants to do to increase our sustainability. Um, I know that we are discussing having a sustainability committee and I think that that is a great opportunity for the community to get involved and offer their feedback as to how they want our city to become leaders in environment um, measures. And I do think that as new housing is being built, our priority should be focusing on are they going to be efficient and are they going to meet our environmental uh, measures. All right, and Sue, your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, you know we have been working on this with a general plan talking about how new builds will be done in the future, uh, focusing on electric, focusing on uh, drought resistant um, landscaping, those kinds of items to reduce water usage, which is obviously very key. I think the city is very committed to this. Uh, for those that you don't know, that the new library is is built in that fashion. Uh, it's uh, net zero and it's net zero carbon. Uh, so it's fully run by the solar panels that are on the roof, um, and it's all electric. So there's no natural gas being used. In addition, all the landscaping outside is is watered with uh, recycled water. So th those are you know. That just gives you an indication of where the city is looking. We're very fortunate. We have a lot of purple pipe, which is recycled water in Pleasant Hill. Um, I'd like to see the expansion of the use of recycled water to reduce our water usage. Most of our parks, Contra Costa Country Club, um, a lot of our medians is all watered with recycled water. I get questions all the time saying, you know, how come these things are all still green? And, and so I explained that we're using recycled water and we're fortunate to have all these purple pipe. There's been some discussion about every time a development is done that we per put purple pipe in so that later on we can connect it all and use uh, purple recycled water for irrigation. So those are that's one of the directions that we've looked at to improve environmental issues. And there's, you know, a lot of people brought up walkability. Um, we're looking at these electric uh, scooters for mobility. Obviously, we would have to work with our partners, East Bay Regional Parks that, and uh, Rec and Park that control some of the trails um, as we put in new housing and new developments, making sure trails are put in to en enhance that walkability. 
We're also focused on um, sort of neighborhood hubs so that people, as housing goes in, they have neighborhoods to walk to easily, to go get you know, grocery, go get their coffee, rather than having to drive all the way downtown. So that's also part of the 20-year general plan and vi uh, vision. So there's lots of avenues, um, composting, waste recycling, um, that we can work on, but I think the, um, the city has been and, and will continue to be uh, focused on in those areas. All right. When we talk about businesses too, we talk about small businesses. You guys have all mentioned, uh, you know, keeping that small town feel. The pandemic obviously has been really, really difficult on so many businesses out there. So where do you think the city in its role of helping support those who are struggling or those who are, even have left or are trying to come back, where do you see the city's role in that? And then Andre, we'll start with you. Oh, thank you. Well, as a small business owner, um, I, I know the effects of the pandemic. Uh, it was a very big struggle for uh, myself and a lot of my peers. I saw some people lose their businesses. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of resources out there, and it's not really about us doing something different. It's about more awareness. Uh, you have through the Chamber of Commerce, through Rotary, through uh, DVC and a few of the other schools, uh, some classes that are available, mentorships that are available, and also free resources that are available. I know with my trade organization, we have a mentor program for struggling auto shops, okay? So it's about making those connections and having someone on the council who is a small business owner and understands the struggles that they go through, I think really, um, would be a benefit to the city. Uh, also, my brain, the way I think, I'm looking forward going, okay, how do we, uh, we're talking about building, we're talking about environmental, we're talking about all these different things. And, and that's all great and that's all wonderful, but small business is what drives this country. 99% of businesses are owned by small business owners. 44% of all revenue generated by business activity is small business owners. So I'm committed uh, to helping our current business owners thrive and listening to them and listening to the stakeholders involved, but also of, of helping those um, that want to open a small business, also helping those less fortunate. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a large group of people that want to get into this, that want to have a business. And, uh, um, you know, maybe working along with the chamber, working along with DVC, we can develop a program for those who don't have the means to open a small business to get a small business. All right, Johnny, your thoughts? I, I like to think that with small business, we want to focus on increasing the business that we are attracting. Um, we do have a lot of small business in Pleasant Hill right now, and we also have some uh, bigger box stores available to our residents. I think making sure that we are mentoring the businesses currently in place and providing programs to be equitable to start businesses for individuals that are underserved would be beneficial for our community as well as attracting additional business from outside of our city and filling those empty storefronts that we have. That is a priority for Pleasant Hill and that is a priority for me as well. Okay. So um, a couple of things just the city has been has done uh, and is doing to help the small businesses. Obviously, uh, during the pandemic, uh, ordinances had to be changed pretty quickly to allow restaurants to have outside areas, take up parking spots, things like that. And we will certainly be looking to try to continue that because it's been very successful, I think, going forward. Um, so we also provided decals and signs and, and some of the PPP that people needed uh, for uh, PPE that they needed to actually continue to work through that process. So I think that was great. As we're coming out, uh, we use some of our ARPA funds to also um, try to enhance the business community. Pleasant Hill Perks, uh, where people can buy a gift card for let's say $100 and the city puts in an additional $50 and they can be used for participating businesses within Pleasant Hill. So that's great. It encourages people to go out and shop the, the, the the store is in Pleasant Hill, and it gives them additional money to get back into the economy. So that's, that's been a real big plus. The second thing is providing grants. So many businesses were caught off guard trying to do um, online business during COVID, where that's all they could do. So we've, we've provide, set money aside to provide grants to um, help those businesses that 
are looking for ways to improve their online presence. And so there's a grant process. I think the amount that we um, set aside from the ARPA money was a half a million dollars for both Pleasant Hill Perks and, um, and these grants and other ways our economic development can see to help the small businesses. So I think those are some of the ways we've been addressing um, the issue and, and we'll continue to look. We have a, an economic development person that works with the business community. Uh, part of the ARPA money, I should say, um, we also gave the chamber money because obviously the chamber was impacted and, and there are one of our groups that works really closest with the business community. So uh, we gave the Chamber of Commerce $60,000 to keep them going and, and vibrant and get them back involved to, to help our business community. The last point I want to make is we have a light industrial area that has struggled a bit with its identity over the last several years. So uh, we are looking at ways to change the businesses and zoning, keep that light industrial fear there, but also maybe attract other research type companies, things that can, smaller businesses, incubator type businesses that can work in that area. So um, those, are, those are a handful of things that we can focus on and continue to work on to improve our, our community. All right, Zach, your thoughts on small business. Yeah, I mean, I don't own a small business, but I just I sympathize with, with Andre and hearing, you know, there, you've stories all over the, of the country of, of, of how this horrible pandemic has affected small business. And, and it's something that I, you know, is one of a, a priority for me as well. Uh, and and here's, here's, where, here's where I'm thinking, where I'm going with this. Uh, we have a new leadership in our Chamber of Commerce, and I'm really excited about that going forward. And I think we need to, as a city, uh, tight, more tightly couple with the Chamber. Uh, and, and I like some of the things that we've done as a city, I, but I'd like to see it go a little bit further. Uh, I, you know, $60,000 is great. I think we could probably add more to that and, and get more money into that Chamber so that they can go out and reach out to more people and bring more people in and, and make them more aware, because it's all about, it's about communication, right? Uh, Pleasant Hill Perks is a great, I like that program. It's really, it's pretty cool. But I feel like I'm one of these people that like knows, you know, I think like all of us here, we have a little bit more inside information than some of the other people. And I talk to people and they're like, I've never heard of it. I don't, I don't know what it is. And then they go on the website and it's like, Zach, how do you, I've gotten things, how do I work with, how do I, you know? So I think there's some, I think there's some great programs within the city that are gonna help small businesses. I would just like to, I think we could just kind of, you know, up it a little bit. Uh, and I think that'll go a, a long way. And then also my final thing is too, which is what Sue touched on, which I think is great, is to continue to look at economic development in our city that is is you know diverse as possible and looking at you know your healthcare believe it or not is a, is a significant component in in our in our city so uh, I'd like to you know see us continue to diversify our, our economy in Pleasant Hill. Okay, thank you. Can I circle back with one last thing? Sure. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, just about the current situation with inflation. We have highest inflation we've seen. Uh, I saw the numbers come out for uh, since March of 1979, which is before I was born. Um, and I see it in my business, and I just want to uh, make sure I stress to all of our uh, citizens in Pleasant Hill that uh, we are all struggling like you uh, to keep our doors open and to pay for the products and pay for the things that we have to pay for. So just please be patient with us and understand when we raise prices, it's not because we want to, it's because we have to. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a very difficult time. Certainly we'll switch gears to public safety and certainly talk about safety in Pleasant Hill. If that is, that is that's a topic that comes up in every town and city, no matter the size, John, will talk with you about your thoughts on, safety in Pleasant Hill and our public safety services. Our public safety services are wonderful, especially in Pleasant Hill. Our crime rate is uh, very low, and the, high, the crime that we typically do get is um, property theft, and that usually is uh, around Contra Costa Boulevard, which is actually my neighborhood. <laughs> I live on Ruth Drive, um, and I do believe that our police department is very well suited to do their job, and they are struggling with their numbers. They do not have enough staff, but they are still doing everything that they can to ensure that our public is safe and they are committed to our community. Um, our firefighters, um, Contra Costa County Fire Department, 
is a district fire department, so we do not have our own firefighters here, but my um, husband actually is a firefighter, so I am a big supporter of them, <laughs> and I have been endorsed by the local um, 1230 union of the firefighters, and I am very proud of what our community has to work with. All right, Sue, your thoughts? So, uh, as, as Anna mentioned, our public um, safety police force is just tremendous, and they're a wonderful community resource. They are engaged in all our community events, and, and, and they've done a fantastic job. And, and, and as a result, our, our crime is fairly low, but the property uh, crime, and, and you hear more about it these days because of social media, so everybody gets a sense of a massive increase in property crimes, and there is some on the property side, but otherwise, Pleasant Hill is a very safe community. We need to continue to focus on that. Our police department, as all police departments, are having challenge maintaining their numbers, uh, primarily from retirements, uh, people moving on to do different types of jobs, not people leaving necessarily go elsewhere. So uh, we'll continue to focus on that. Um, our chief did uh, start a citizen advisory committee last year, uh, I believe it was last year, uh, to in in involve the community more in what the police is doing and how it can work better with the community. And I think that was a great idea because the more we can involve people, get more volunteers to, to work with the police force, uh, the better off the entire community is gonna be. Uh, two areas, you know, obviously homelessness is a concern for everybody and how that factors into safety. Uh, we do um, work with Martinez and we have a team of core individuals that come and work with the homeless uh, regularly. We've had some success, but as everybody knows, homelessness has increased and, and some concerns on safety um, revolve around that. So we will be continuing to work with, with CORE and with our community relations officer to to work on those issues. Um, it's, uh, you know, for me, safety also f falls into traffic. Uh, we've got a lot of speeding, a lot of erratic uh, traffic, so we're gonna have to work on that. That dovetails into the police and having sufficient police force to do that. But we have to work with our regional communities. A lot of, um, a lot of the activity that we find out happens in Pleasant Hill is not necessarily Pleasant Hill residents. And so we have to work regionally to enhance the safety of the whole area to, to improve Pleasant Hill's safety as well. And I think that's super important. So that's our sheriff's department, uh, the police departments in our neighboring communities, um, and, and then um, with the other, um, like the fire department and other core and other entities, the mental health uh, community at the county level to all work um, in, in the same direction. Zach, public safety, your thoughts. Uh, this is one area where I feel like I have a pretty proven track record of working with you know, Pleasant Hill uh, Police Department. First of all, they are a tremendous police force, I believe, as well. And I think they've done a great job in the last couple of years of uh, social media and, and interacting with the community. Uh, you know, their light of the night was fantastic. Uh, and so I, I really do commend them for their, their work. Um, I think one of the big decisions that uh, we have ahead of us is to replace the chief, who's just recently announced his retirement. So uh, I have experience with that as a as a uh, record Rec and Park board member of having to make a, you know or, or and, and be involved in the process of, of hiring making a very important hire. Uh, in our case, it was with the general manager. So I I, I I'm aware and I, I want to make I would make sure that that person uh, you know like Chief Hill uh, understands our community as, as as you know and these candidates really understand what we're looking for with public safety. Uh, also, uh, since I've been on that board, uh, you know, we've developed a really good relationship with, with the police department. And in fact, we've had a program recently where we bought a motorcycle for them uh, so that they could patrol some of the, the areas of the, the trails, even if they're not our trails, you know, some of the things that we have connect with, you know, the trails that are run by the county. And so we have a program with, with them uh, and they can get up into Pasanagal Park in the open spaces because oftentimes we have some, some off-leash dogs and, and it's just nice to know that we can have law enforcement up there as well. And we've worked with them pretty closely with, uh, with us, uh, with the parks and, and the homeless and, and, and getting them to the services that they need out of the parks and to where they, to where they need to be in the the services that they need. Okay, Andre. Public safety. Um, so before I was a business owner, I uh, uh, worked in Northern California for LoJack. A lot of people have heard of that company before, and um, got to really understand how police works 
and, and how multiple jurisdictions uh, can work together uh, whenever there's a situation. Like, for example, in Pleasant Hill, they don't have low jack. It's uh, Martinez does and Walnut Creek does. So whenever they get a, get a hit on a stolen vehicle, they work in conjunction with those other departments. So uh, part of, part of uh, public safety is that regional um, presence of everyone working together. Um, homelessness is, is an issue. We have to have compassion. These people, um, some of them have mental health issues. Some of them uh, have uh, substance abuse issues. And I know that the police do everything that they can and they bring um, people from the county uh, to work with those people as well to get them off the streets whenever we can. Uh, I know there's a bill that came down that's uh, about every about hospitalization potentially for people. Um, I haven't really had a chance to really dive into that bill just yet, but it looks like the, um, the assembly really likes it and the governor might sign it. Um, the other thing that comes with public safety is some, these are the, the largest group of people that we typically employ within the city. Um, and having someone representing you at, that, at the level of city council that has managed people um, and has a management degree. Um, I've managed over 400 union employees over 10 states. Um, I've done through the HR process, I've, I've worked with union stewards, I've worked with um, union managers and non-union managers. And uh, so uh, when it comes to the public safety, I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure they have all the tools that they need to do their job and to make sure that the HR side of it um, um, has the right tools for them as well and, and recruiting. We need to have the best staff and they have, are the best staff, but we just need to continue, to continue having great police officers. Yeah, I want to pull on a thread where you just kind of put up there in terms of cost and, and a budget mm -hmm. and and ask if you're at the table and you're fighting for more money, which area are you fighting for the most that they may think doesn't have enough money or you would think needs more resources right now? If you had to pick a spot, where wow. would it be? Okay, that's, uh, well, that's interesting because I sit on the budget committee for um, Pleasant Hill and I have for the last seven years. Uh, my degree, I have an MBA as well, and spent 28 years in finance. So um, that's one of the areas that I spend quite a bit of time on um, with the city. The police and our staff makes up almost 70% of the costs um, of the city. And so it's an important feature. The police are obviously extremely important uh, in order to be able to attract and retain uh, good police officers. That's very important. Uh, but our public works guys are also the same. They're the ones that make sure that our city stays clean, uh, is well maintained. Uh, so good staff is very important and that's clearly a primary focus. But it's kind of circular. Uh, our city relies heavily on sales tax dollars. Uh, nearly 40% of our general fund comes from sales tax dollars on our Measure K, which pays for our library and other uh, vital uh, infrastructure improvements is all sales tax driven or sale, um, tr um, yeah, sales tax driven. So those things are very important. So as a result, economic development is also extremely important to have a vibrant city. So we rely heavily on getting grants for our street work and our, uh, those kinds of projects. That's really important. In order to do that, you've got to have excellent engineering and planning staff. In order to have, so it's really making sure, in my mind, having the right people to do the right activity will improve the police, will enhance our public works, enhance our economic development. That's really key for me. Is so we so not just dollars, right but resources. So the dollar, well, I mean, dollars, but dollars it's, you know, it's, it, there's, it's not just dollars, but obviously dollars are important in competing for the best people. And so that in my mind is where I think you have to put your money where your mouth is in order to, to make sure we've got a, a good, strong community. Okay. Zach, your thoughts where you fight for more money in the budget? Uh, I, think, I think the areas that, and I also, I sit on the, the Recreation and Park District Board Budget Committee as well and have done so for about three years. And it's, uh, it, it's always the, uh, the dance between not only um, <laughs> not only looking at, at you know your your short term costs, but your long term costs too, right? And and, and what, what are those retirement costs going to be and all that? So that is you know I think when you're looking at this, you you not only have to look at the cost, the immediate needs, but what is that what is that stuff? What is 
those, uh, those, those, those people going to cost us down the road in terms of, of, of retirement and PERS and, 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 that, and, so, and, and that. So that's the dance. But as far as for me, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for dollars in, in this, roughly in the same areas I think that Sue is. You know, you're looking at, you know, what, what do people want? They want to feel safe and they want to have roads that work, right? And, 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 to, and as she articulated that, those not only take the actual physical dollars, they also take the, the resources in terms of people to implement it. So I think those, those are as, you know, the kind of the, the, key, the key areas. You know, I, I, like I said, I would like to see some money put into more into economic development, but when you look at the costs, um, I believe we're gonna be spending like $15 million in, on our, on our, in terms of uh, fixing the roads here in the next few years. You know, those, those, kinds, of, those, those kinds of monies, uh, we're, you know, we're gonna need to spend them as, as well. And, and so it's, it's really the, it's the, it's the roads, it's the public safety and economic development. Okay, Andre, your priority when it comes to arguing for or debating or asking for more money? <laughs> yeah, so so when we talk about money, money, I, I, ha I have this discussion in my mind and, and with my staff all the time. Um, you know, right now, we were talking about inflation earlier, so we gotta really look and, and make some hard decisions over the next few years when it comes to budget. Um, but if I'm gonna fight for budget, I'm gonna fight on the premise of, of, of cleanliness and safety. I mean, bottom line, cleanliness and safety. Because when we have a safe, clean community, that's a community that people want to be in. That's a that's a pro business community. Because um, Sue said it best. Everything everything relies on sales tax revenue. If if we don't have people buying products in our city and using the businesses in our city, um, we don't get sales tax revenue. They're going to go to the next city over. So as long as we're as long as people feel safe in the community, they and they see that the roads are clean and that. Uh, uh, there's not clutter everywhere, which we have. Uh, those are going to be always the things that I'm going to look for first, is make sure those two things, because that's pro-community and that's pro-business. Donna, your priority. I would, um, I would like to focus on economic development and provide additional funds for them to attract business into Pleasant Hill and then use that sales tax funds to provide mental health services for our families. I think that is an area that we are lacking in Pleasant Hill is that we have partnered with our county partners. Uh, we have uh, the A3 program with the Miles Hall Center and the Martinez group that we've partnered with, the core group, they are only in Pleasant Hill two days a week offering services to our homeless population and um, families seeking assistance. We are not doing enough to provide support for the children that are our future. And if we want to think long term, we have to provide services for the families with the young kids, offer mental health support for them. So in 20, 30 years, they are not part of our homeless population. Okay. And I think we're, we have time for one more question can for I you guys to add. One yes, you can. I, I just want to add a quick note because there, there are financial challenges, and, and, and everybody will acknowledge that. Um, we have a, a lo fairly large unfunded pension liability, mm -hmm. as, as most people do that have um, uh, CalPERS employees. And, and, and it's, it's complicated. And, and I want people to understand that the, the CalPERS unfunded liability is mostly driven from our employees that have been with us for a very long time, or have been employed since 2000, prior to 2011, and, and or they're retired already. And so changing that is, is very difficult to do. These people have worked with us for a long time and they're relying on these pensions for their retirement. CalPERS uh, does not allow you to, um, if you have um, CalPERS employees, they all have to be CalPERS employees. You can't start new people not in CalPERS. So there's no way around that. If you decide to get out of CalPERS, they reduce your discount rate to about 1.5% and our unfunded liability would go from about 35 million to about 160 million. That's nothing that we want to do either. So this is something we're going to have to keep an eye on, focus on. We did start a 115 trust, which can be used to address uh, CalPERS in the long run when it really peaks. Um, but this is going to put a financial burden on the city over the next several years. We have to acknowledge it. We have to understand it. We have to understand what we can and cannot do about it. Um, but it, it, I just it's important for everybody to acknowledge it's there, and we, we have to address it. In, in our financial planning going forward. Not a small part of the budget. No, not a small part of the budget. <laughs> okay, I wanna talk about, it. it's been so great to have this discussion, everyone has great ideas, but as people are filling out that ballot, they need to, they need to pick two, <laughs> right? And so I, I wanna ask each one of you, what makes you distinctive? What makes you different as they're looking at this list of six names in terms of before they fill the bubble in? And Zach, let's start with you in terms of when when someone is voting for Zach Chess, 
who are they voting for that makes you different? When they're when someone's looking at the ballot and they see see my name, what I hope that they look at is uh, somebody who has brought uh, years of you know community experience, uh, both in the in in the in the um, public sector, being in a rec recreation and park district board, you know managing a ten million dollar budget, uh, you know over the last you know ten years. So you, you're, you're, you're having somebody who's got experience, but with a fresh voice for Pleasant Hill, someone who comes in with a new perspective that has experience in the public sector. Someone also who has been steeped in this community since 2003, when I arrived with a five-month-old and a five-year-old. And since then, and they, those two boys have grown up, but during that time, you know, we uh, raised a lots of, my wife and I raised lots of money for the local schools to get computer aids, uh, and, and also with, uh, you know, with, with coaching kids in, in Pleasant Hill Baseball Association. So uh, there's someone that you're gonna get with Zach as someone who's, ex who's an experienced, uh, in dealing with government, has relationships throughout the city, uh, and really cares deeply about this community. Okay, Andre, uh, and what makes you distinctive? Well, yeah, what makes me distinctive is, I mean, at the end of the day, let's go down to the brass tacks here. Um, when you are uh, filling out that ballot, you wanna have someone who has the experience, uh, the knowledge, the educational background, and understands the current economic climate. Um, that's what it boils down to in my eyes. However, there's also the soft side of it, right? I'm a father, just like uh, a lot of people here. I have two kids and my wife has another one on the way. We're gonna have, be having a baby in November, uh, right around Thanksgiving. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I wanna make sure that, we, that my children can still live here in this city and afford to be able to be here. I wanna make sure that all of our children have that opportunity. And also I wanna make sure over the next four years that we have the ability to pay our bills. Uh, because uh, we have a, a lot of challenges, you know, as a nation, as a world with inflation and the economy going on right now. So that's, uh, that's what, what I bring to the table. Donna? It's very clear I'm not a politician, and I am very new to being in the political sphere. And what I bring to the table is being a regular Joe Schmo. I am a mom, two kids, five and three, and I need to ask a lot of questions. And before I would make any decision, I would want to get feedback from the community. I would seek where I can find the answers, have open conversations, and try to understand why decisions are being made before making a decision. I don't come in with um, an idea in mind as to this is how it should be and this is why I'm doing this and I'm going to push just for this because this is my agenda. My agenda is to be the voice for the people of Pleasant Hill and to learn with them and to grow with them because this is our city and my kids are going to be here and I want them to stay in Pleasant Hill with me and I want our families to be the future and make the right decisions for them. All right. Sue, your thoughts on what makes you distinct? On so I'm, I'm distinct, one, because I'm the current incumbent, um, uh, the only incumbent in the race, and I've been on the council for eight years. Um, I think I have represented the people well in, in Pleasant Hill. Um, I was the lead on the Measure K campaign that brought about the library and uh, tripling our repaving programs and uh, closing sidewalk gaps and a lot of infrastructure, storm drain improvements. Uh, I sit on a lot of regional um, uh, boards, as I mentioned before, CCTA, Transpac. Um, so I bring a regional perspective on trying to do solutions for transportation and traffic and the like. And I also have a steep background in both finance and also in the community. I ran several PTAs. Um, I started the Foundation for Pleasant Hill Education and ran that for 10 years, bringing about $350,000 to the Pleasant Hill Public Schools. Um, I, I'm a Rotary member, um, and so there's, um, I also, the key thing for me is I'm approachable. When people call me or, or send me letters, I respond. I sat down with three people just the other day in my backyard to talk about issues on the housing side, and so while I've got all this experience and background, I, I still feel that I'm very approachable and really truly represent the people of Pleasant Hill, and so um, that's what makes me unique. All right, and certainly we appreciate everyone coming in and having this discussion. So important for people to get to know you. Uh, that leads us right into uh, where we're heading next, which is our closing remarks. We want to thank all of our candidates for answering some of these important questions. And each candidate is now going to have 
two minutes to make a closing statement. We started in one order. We'll go in reverse order for our closing statement. That means Zach Chess, you get to kick us off. Thank you, Claudine. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to speak with you today. Pleasant Hill has been the, the backdrop of some of my family's uh, greatest joys and toughest challenges and, and everything in between. And I'm running to serve as your next city council because I care deeply about this community. If elected, I would bring my passion for community and my unique and applicable experience to City Hall. Uh, to, and, 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 and as a, a person who served on the board of directors for, for 10 years here in Pleasant Hill, including three years as a, as, a, as a board chair, I have a proven track record of fiscal responsibility, facility and program expansion, and prioritizing inclusivity. I ushered in the adoption of a long-term district master plan. I've, remodel, I've led the charge to remodel Pleasant Oaks Park uh, with new fields and an all abilities playground. I also worked with staff and led the negotiations to buy property that was originally deemed to be housing that is now gonna be a park one day behind the new library. I've advocated for and implemented board policies that have reduced tax burden on, or debt burden on taxpayers uh, and set up cost recovery measures to gauge the financial viability of the programming at the Reckon Park District. And have established a reserve fund which uh, was very, well, very much needed in the last couple years of the COVID-19 pandemic. So clearly, I know how to get things done. And I'm ready to work hard and bring a fresh voice to our city council to ensure our city remains a safe, economically vibrant and inclusive place to live and own a business. You know, Pleasant Hill deserves leadership for everyone. I respectfully ask for your vote. Zach Shess for ph.com. And you can see me there also on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Zach Shess. I'm gonna go to Sue Nowak. You have the mic is yours for your thank closing you. statement. I also want to thank the League of Women Voters. They are a great voice in the community for um, uh, nonpartisan information on elections, and I really appreciate their support, and obviously CCTV for hosting this event today. Uh, Pleasant Hill has been my family's home for 24 years, and it has been my honor to serve on the city council for the last eight years, including uh, terms as vice mayor and mayor. I've worked hard to Make sure we keep the small community feel that makes Pleasant Hill such a great place to live while focusing on the challenges that will ensure a positive future for the city. My fellow council members and I affirm Pleasant Hill as an inclusionary city and with our Civic Action and New Diversity Commission, we'll continue to take action to support that ideal. Pleasant Hill has completed its most exciting project, our new Pleasant Hill Library, and hopefully all of you had a chance to visit it. Uh, from being the chair of the Measure K campaign to being on the library task force and the, and the council's library subcommittee, I've ensured that we build a state-of-the-art library while also prioritizing investments in our streets and other vital infrastructure projects. The future is not without challenges as evidenced by the work of the General Plan Advisory Committee. Demands and requirements for increased housing must be balanced with a desire to maintain our small town feel. We need to continue work on traffic issues and opportunities for alternate forms of transportation. My participation on the board of the Contra Costa County Connection and CCTA and TransPAC will keep me on the forefront of those issues and potential solutions. Our current funds to operate our great city and lack of debt provide a positive foundation but will con require consistent monitoring. My experience on council, my 28 year finance career and seven years on the city's budget committee gives me the skills and experience. I'd be honored to have your vote for more information about ways to support my campaign. Please go to suenoac.com. Thank you. All right, thank you. Jonna Thompson, the microphone is yours for your two minute closing statement. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and all the volunteers and citizens here today. The catalyst event that led me to make my decision to run happened last year. My daughter and I were crossing Taylor Boulevard on our way home from school and we were nearing the end of the crosswalk. She looked at me and asked if she can run the last 10 steps to catch up to her friend in front of her. I hesitated, I looked around, I didn't see any cars and I said, sure, go ahead. And she started to cross and at that moment a car blew through the crosswalk, turning left, and it was centimeters from my daughter's face. Um, I'd like to say that was the only event that occurred, but in the same crosswalk on Taylor Boulevard, we witnessed two additional incidents walking to school um, that my daughter was involved in, and one of them where a car hit another and spun into a group of children. Thankfully, no one was injured, and they all made it to their class safe. 
I knew that we had to do better for families. Walking to school should not be a death sentence, and families need to know that they are safe when we navigate the streets of Pleasant Hill. My focus is on accessibility for all residents to key locations, pedestrian safety, increasing walkability, green infrastructure, and smart growth development. Public safety and bringing and supporting small businesses and keeping the community feel we have in Pleasant Hill. I am a Director of Quality Assurance and Mental Health and a Board Certified Behavior Analyst, and my experience is working directly with families and walking beside them in their most difficult times and providing linkages to services and resources that will bring them into a better future. Let's make Pleasant Hill a place for families to raise generations, a place where a community is the lifeblood of our city, a place where our children are looking to start a family, they can purchase a home in Pleasant Hill and thrive. Imagine what we can do for our community and our families if we work together to make a difference. JohnnaThompson.com. Thank you, everyone. All right, Jonna, thank you. And Andrea Walensky, your two minutes. Thank you, Jonna. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, Zach. Thanks to the League of Women Voters for uh, putting on this event. Uh, I'm new to the game. I'm not a politician. I've uh, been in business for a long, long time. We've talked about that throughout this uh, round table. Um, but what I do have is I do have the, uh, um, the knowledge and experience in that realm that I can bring forth into the city council position. What I haven't talked about is I haven't talked about what I do in the community. Um, I am a big supporter of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I'm a major donor for the Rainbow Community Center and was just at their soft opening last week to see at Salvio Center uh, as such a safe space uh, for that community to be able to thrive. I also had uh, Kiku at my uh, shop yesterday because I repair their vans for them at no charge and assist, assist them with that because that van is going out and helping the, the, the trans youth in this, in this community that are marginalized. Um, I also uh, run a nonprofit uh, language school with my wife uh, and we work with a Ukrainian theater studio and currently um, we are sponsoring a Ukrainian family to come over here from Kiev that uh, um, it's a friend of a, it's a relative of a friend. Um, and we do whatever we can to support that community. We've been doing this for years, uh, helping refugees that come in, um, providing a, a community space, a community center, and a place for, for them to, to be able to speak and be around people like them. Uh, I'm, I'm a parent, <laughs> um, I'm a husband, I'm a homeowner, I'm a business owner, and I'm here uh, to make sure that I represent you in Pleasant Hill. Thank you very much, AndreaBolinsky.com, and also uh, you can find me on Facebook. All right, and I'd like to thank each one of you guys for being here. It's so important for people to be able to hear from you and, uh, and, and think more about everything that you've been saying as they prepare to vote. This does conclude our forum of candidates who are running for city council in the city of Pleasant Hill. Once again, your six candidates running for two seats are Bill Bankert, Sue Nowak, Andre Obolinski, Daniel Rodriguez, Zach Schess, and Jana Thompson. And for more in-depth information on the candidates, ballot measures, and who supports them, go to votersedge.org. The last day to register is October 4th. All eligible registered Contra Costa voters will receive a vote by mail ballot for the November 8th general election. And you can find detailed information on the upcoming election on the Contra Costa County elections website, cocovote.us. I'm Claudine Wong from KTVU Channel 2 News. Thank you for watching and don't forget to vote on November 8th.